Welcome to season two of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Joshua Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement, and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, Stephanie Desmond talks to Stefania Albanesi, an economist who studies women in the workforce. They discuss how a disproportionate number of women in the United States appear to be dropping out of the workforce during the pandemic, presumably to care for their children and to oversee virtual learning. They talk about what this could mean for their careers. Let's listen. Stefania Albanesi, thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So today we're going to talk about the impact of the uh, pandemic-related recession is having on women. Talk to me about what we're seeing in terms of women in the workplace. Well, I would uh, identify two separate phases. So the first phase was in March and April and early May when we had all the government mandated shutdowns and even in the states that did not have that, just a lot of concern about catching uh, coronavirus from establishments, you know, with a lot of contact with uh, workers uh, from the standpoint of employees or with other customers and and workers from the standpoint of customers. So what we saw was a big reduction um, in activity uh, that resulted in employment losses in uh, basically um, high contact occupation, meaning the health uh, sector in personal services and um, sales occupation that requires direct contact with the the customers. And also, you know, most of these occupations um, cannot be done Remotely, so they are also inflexible uh, from that perspective. And they happen to be occupations that are mainly female. So, for example, um, <clears throat> healthcare is 77% uh, female as an occupation. So women were disproportionately affected um, by those activities, which is um, kind of um, um, remarkable because in most uh, standard recessions, it's usually male-dominated manufacturing occupations that tend to lose jobs first and the most. So um, the impact of the COVID shock initially was very, very gendered uh, in that respect. And then as these lockdowns and in general, as we got out of this first phase of very intense, uh, you know, reaction uh, to the coronavirus, we saw a resurgence, you know, uh, that that we saw in the aggregate data and employment numbers uh, varying quite a bit by state, depending on, um, you know, the pandemic um, effect on the state. And there is where you see more of a subtle reaction um, in that, women, particularly higher income and married women, have not returned uh, to the workforce um, and their employment numbers have not picked up as much as they have for men or even, uh, you know, never married women. Um, and and so what we see, what we've seen in the summer and also there were some, um, you know, worrying numbers out of the Bureau of Labor Force, um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, in September, there was a big decline uh, in participation uh, particularly of uh, women with children and married women more in general. And this, I think, is not so much related uh, to, you know, the effect of the pandemic directly on employment, but more the indirect effect of having to manage possibly children who are at home with unpredictable, you know, schooling arrangements and so on. And, um, and so, and this is also mainly more of a higher income phenomenon. So whereas the job losses that we saw in March and April and early May were pretty much across the board, um, you know, for women, because they were so exposed, um, you know, uh, from a occupation and sector representation, uh, the, the summer and uh, early fall uh, numbers that we've seen of, you know, reduced uh, labor force participation seem to be more concentrated amongst higher income women. So these women are dropping out of the workforce. What is that going to mean for the long term? 
Well, so that's what it would seem. And um, it's a little bit hard to compare to the past. So traditionally, uh, though this has not been something that has happened as often in the last 20, 25 years, but traditionally women did drop out for two or three years when they had their first child or, you know, during childbearing, and then they would, you know, go back. And that usually is quite costly from the standpoint of earnings, not only the earnings that women lose in the time where they're not working, but their, you know, prospective lifetime earnings earnings when they return. So many women cannot find a job that was comparable to the one that they had before dropping out, um, you know, for um, uh, childcare reasons. And so they re-enter the job ladder at a lower wage. And this has a permanent effect on the the earnings for the remaining uh, time of their life. Now, in this case, um, there's, um, at some level, on the one hand, it may be better than usual. And on the other hand, it may be worse. It may be better because because we all understand that this is a common shock that is really out of the control of any single individual. Um, and so having a gap in your resume or having had, the, had to leave the workforce for a year or a year and a half, you know, may not seen um, with any, you know, stigma or, you know, any concern about, you know, a particular woman's commitment to their career and so on when things go back to normal. So um, in that respect, um, I think, um, you know, the, the, the effect should be is smaller. On the other hand, there is a caveat to that, uh, that um, the impression is that we don't have, you know, a lot of, um, you know, pervasive and solid data on this, but it would seem that many firms are innovating very fast and transforming workplace and adopting new technologies that were perhaps already available, but, you know, because we are all sort of dealing with this uh, shock, you know, it's forcing firms to change uh, and innovate faster. So usually something that does happen when uh, workers take some time out of the workforce is that they experience what, what, what economists call human capital depreciation. So your, your skills, you know, some of your skills may become obsolete as well as you, you become rusty in some of the skills that, you, you know, you still have. And that may be happening at a faster rate right now, particularly in sectors that are responding to this crisis with, with a lot of workplace innovation. Um, so, so these are, you know, on the one hand, it might be better than usual. On the other hand, it may be worse than usual. And it's hard to know at this point how the two effects will, uh, you know, uh, meter out. And it may that be that there's a variation across specific occupation or specific firms uh, with respect to these two forces playing a role. Mm-hmm. Are we seeing race as a factor here? Yeah, so um, um, uh, yes, because particularly in personal services. Uh, and when you say personal services, what do you mean by that? Um, you think about, you know, hair salons, um, nail salons, but also health aids, um, you know, uh, people who take care of children or elderly, um, you know, folks in the context of their homes and so on. Um, there are a lot of, there's a lot of immigrant uh, labor, uh, so um, particularly Latino immigrants, but also, you know, Asian immigrants, as well as, you know, African-American women are overrepresented in these sectors as well. Um, and so there's definitely a, a dimension of that. Um, and, uh, you know, particularly um, for African-American women who uh, tend to be um, uh, overrepresented amongst the never married uh, women uh, in, in the low end of the wage distribution, uh, that uh, certainly has had uh, an adverse effect uh, on their employment uh, more so uh, than uh, I think for white women who tend to be, um, you know, overrepresented a little bit on the higher end uh, of the wage distribution. So there has been uh, a racial dimension. And if you do look at the um, uh, employment situation report, the monthly report uh, from uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, actually um, for immigrant women, uh, there is a table that focuses particularly on the um, various uh, labor market outcomes for immigrant women and men. Uh, there, that They have seen the largest decline uh, in employment to population ratio of, of all um, you know, uh, racial groups. Uh, so, so that's uh, something that uh, is uh, potentially very Mm -hmm. And it's it. Some of it, I I imagine, has to do with society, right? Women uh, definitely do most of the unpaid labor in the household, and they still, even though women have uh, in recent years really caught up with men in terms of being in the workforce, women are still doing the unpaid labor at home. Yeah. So is this this this? So society is contributing to this. 
Well, so that's, uh, uh, you know, I've actually done some work on this, uh, uh, you know, uh, some years ago with one of my co-authors uh, where we were trying to sort of examine this question, you know, where does this process start? Uh, because to the extent that, uh, you know, women have um, less financial rewarding career paths ahead, call it the glass ceiling, um, whatever it is, you know, then within a household, uh, say, take a couple of parents, it's in individually optimal for that household, for the mother, the female partner, to be tending more to home activities, such as you take your kids to the dentist, or you, you know, uh, you help them with Zoom school, or whatever it is. Uh, but then the question is, why is it that women have less rewarding careers? And uh, so what we looked at is that historically, indeed, uh, because um, being pregnant uh, had so many health consequences, including, you know, high probability of dying, uh, and also, you know, children needed to be breastfed, and there were no alternatives to that. So there was actually an economic reason that you know uh, led women to have to devote more time to childcare, and therefore, while you're doing that, you do also other home activities. And then we looked at the fact that that's no longer really the case. If you look at the data on the direct impact of pregnancy and childbirth on labor productivity of women, because we've had you know even though the U.S. is one of the worst countries with respect to maternal mortality and morbidity in the world, but certainly relative to the 30s and 40s and 50s, we've made you know, a huge amount of progress. So the question is, why are we still here? And, um, you know, so the, w what we think is it, it's sort of a self-fulfilling kind of circle. So there is the societal expectation that, you know, women may be more attached to, you know, performing activities related to their children or less attached to having a career. And therefore, you know, they then have fewer career opportunities, which makes the, it optimal for them to be behave like they're expected. And even the most egalitarian couple, um, you know, for the most part, um, you know, if they decide to be egalitarian in their division of childcare and, and home care responsibility, they're actually missing out economically because, you know, the society is set up, you know, based on that expectation. So there are countries like Sweden uh, that essentially mandate uh, paternity leave by saying, okay, as a, as a couple of parents, you have access to what uh, I don't I forget the exact number of days, but a certain um, number of days for maternal and pater paternity leave. And if the father doesn't take at least a fraction, then as a couple, you you lose a bunch of those days. So it's sort of forcing couples to be more egalitarian. And that's not you so much to you know make decisions on behalf of the parents, but sort of change you know a little bit the societal expectations about who amongst the parents should be taking care of particularly very, very young children. Mm -hmm. And of course, I do, in the US, it's hard to think that something like that would ever be acceptable. But it, what's behind it is the notion that you have this self-fulfilling, you know, arrangement that is really hard to break, you know, with individual decisions. You, you need some, some kind of a shock uh, to the system. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but what you're pointing out is, is why are we seeing, uh, you know, over the summer, uh, you know, this data suggesting that married women, particularly higher income married women seem to be dropping out of the workforce, um, uh, that is most likely because, you know, they are the lower earner of, uh, you know, the, the two parents. Um, that, that would be the optimal thing to do. And what you do see is that as you go up um, the skill ladder, uh, gender wage gaps actually become bigger. So what is not known, you know, there's been a lot of work on the fact that on average, gender wage gaps have gone down in the United States. But most of that is because there are now more skilled women, so women with a college or college and more degree in the workforce. And in fact, on average, women in the workforce have higher years of education than men in the workforce. So American women who work are more educated than American men who work right now. And this has been the case since the early 90s. But if you condition on the level of education, on the level of experience in a particular occupation, the more you condition, the more the gender wage gap grows. So, you know, particularly the high-end occupations, you see more gender differences in earnings and wages. And so that's, I think, one of the reasons why we see this behavior they're sort of at the high end of the income distribution. Mm -hmm. And and these are difficult economic times and they're probably going to stay that way for the near future. Um, what do you see happening in the next six to 12 months? 
Well, so a lot of that will depend on how we deal with uh, the pandemic itself, right? Because uh, um, some of the phenomena that uh, as economists we've been sort of discussing as potential uh, scenarios, such as, you know, uh, some types of jobs get permanently eliminated because they get automated away or, you know, we find uh, a remote way to perform the task and so on. So uh, what we call structural change, so changes in technology that are persistent or permanent are more likely to happen if the health shock lasts longer. Mm -hmm. So when we thought that this was going to be a six-month phenomenon. Nobody, you know, was expecting that there would be per permanent changes to the way we work or the way we live in response to that. If this goes on for a couple of years, you know, the effect is going to be a, a lot deeper and, and there, there will be significant structural change. So it's really hard to then forecast if we're in the middle of, you know, a structural break in the way the economy works. Uh, but there's definitely been, um, we've seen some evidence that that, um, you know, manufacturing companies have increased the degree to which they are moving to automated production because, of course, robots don't catch viruses. And the technology was already there, but it's very costly to adopt new technology. So you either do it if you have a great new opportunity or if you have a, a big negative shock that forces you to do that. And, you know, some personal services are really hard to substitute with, you know, technology or automation. So that probably won't happen. But, um, you know, there's still a, a rethinking, you know, of, of, uh, of expectation with respect to those services, which may have persistent effects. Stefania Albanese, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Public Health On Call is produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, Stephanie Desmond, and Lamari Morales. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, CN Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening.